Hi, my name is Robin Parsons. I'm a midwifery lecturer at Middlesex University and this short video is intended for midwifery students to help them understand what is expected of them during their Viva Voce, Oscar or OSCE. Today we're doing obstetric emergencies and we are covering what to do in the case of an eclamptic fit. As you can see, I have my client in front of me um, and I also have my obstetric emergency equipment. I have a case scenario which is similar to what you will be expected to cover in your OSCE. You are caring for Amira on the antenatal ward. She was admitted at 36 weeks gestation, complaining of a headache, epigastric pain, and found to have high blood pressure. You enter the bay and see Amira having what appears to be an eclamptic fit. Verbalize and demonstrate the action you will take to provide care for Amira and her unborn baby. Preeclampsia is defined as hypertension developing after 20 weeks gestation with new onset proteinuria or other maternal organ dysfunction such as renal or liver complications. It's often linked with uteroplacental dysfunction such as fetal growth restriction. Eclampsia is the onset of seizures in a woman with preeclampsia, which is the obstetric emergency in this scenario. Preeclampsia affects 3% of pregnancies in the UK and it accounted for 4% of maternal deaths in the UK in the last triennium, according to the Embrace report. Its exact etiology is unknown, but it is a disorder of the vascular endothelial function specific to pregnancy and is thought to arise in the placenta due to ischemia. Symptoms can often include a severe and persistent headache, epigastric pain and severe edema and of course hypertension and proteinuria. Women at higher risk of preeclampsia and eclampsia include prima gravida women, women over the age of 40, women with a BMI of over 35, history of preeclampsia in a previous pregnancy or a mother or sister having preeclampsia, uh, multiple pregnancy and an underlying pre-existing medical condition such as diabetes, hypertension or renal disease. Possible complications include HELP syndrome, disseminated intravascular coagulation, cerebral hemorrhage, stroke, pulmonary edema and placental abruption. For my emergency steps, the first thing I'm going to do is pull the emergency buzzer. This should summon help into the room. When help arrives, I will ask a person to put out a double two, double two obstetric emergency call um, and I want them to come back and tell me that they have done that. I'll also ask for somebody to bring the PET trolley with equipment to manage the scenario. In terms of who I will need in the room with me, I will need a senior midwife to provide a helicopter view, other midwives to help with clinical tasks and medication administration. I'll need a senior obstetrician or consultant to assist with their clinical experience and a consultant or registrar or anaesthetist to help with IV access and airway management. We would need to alert theatre staff in case of transfer for delivery. A scribe is needed to document and a runner who can collect extra equipment if needed. I will also need to alert the paediatric team or neonatal unit as delivery may need to be expedited. I will firstly wait for the fit to stop. This should take one to two minutes. Um, I should ensure that the client is safe by removing anything that could be a barrier or could damage her. And I will speak to her in a reassuring manner as she is likely to be able to hear me during the fit. When the fit stops, I will place her in a left lateral position to protect her airway. And I will then need to follow the ABC approach. I should check her airway is patent. If she's able to communicate with me, I will know her airway is patent as she can speak. However, there may be an obstruction such as vomit that I need to suction. I will apply high flow oxygen at 15 litres a minute and check her respiratory rate. I'll apply a pulse oximeter for continuous heart rate and SpO2 and a blood pressure cuff for continuous BP and MAP readings and I'll be asking my scribe to document these on my Muse chart. I then insert two large ball cannulas um, and whilst I'm doing these I'll be taking blood. The cannulas are so we could administer fluid and medication and the bloods are because her bloods are likely to, her biochemistry is likely to be deranged due to her preeclampsia. So I will be taking a group and save in case we need to go to theatre. Using these LFTs and urates, a 
clotting screen as her clotting may be deranged, and an FBC also. I then need to control the seizures, and to do so, I need to administer magnesium sulfate. The loading dose is four grams IV over five to 15 minutes of a slow IV injection. Following this, a maintenance infusion of one gram um, per hour needs to commence for at least 24 hours following the latest fit. Recurrent fit should be treated with a further dose of two to four grams, dependent on maternal booking rates, and that is also given intravenously over five to 15 minutes. We then need to control the blood pressure. And to do so, our first line management is to give the beetle 200 milligrams PO, if, of course, she's able to tolerate this following the fit. This can be done immediately before venous access and so can achieve a very quick result. A second 200 milligram oral dose can be given if needed in 30 minutes. If this is ineffective or she's not able to tolerate this, we can give an IV bolus of 50 milligrams, which should be effective within five minutes. We can give a max of four doses every five minutes until that blood pressure is controlled. And a maintenance dose of four mil an hour can then be started. If she's asthmatic or Afro-Caribbean, we would give nifedipine 10 milligrams orally as our first line treatment. Should she not be able to tolerate nifedipine if she's asthmatic or Afro-Caribbean or if the libitolol is not effective, we can give IV hydralazine. This is five milligrams IV slow over 15 minutes, and we can give that up to a max dose of 20 milligrams until her BP is controlled. We could then start a maintenance IV infusion of 50 milligrams and 50 mils of saline by syringe pump, starting at five mil an hour, titrating with her blood pressure. If we're giving hydralazine, we do need to consider giving up to 500 mil crystalloid fluid before or at the same time as the first dose of the hydralazine to avoid a drop in placental perfusion and fetal bradycardia. We then need to control the fluid. The woman needs to be closely monitor for, monitored for oligourea, pulmonary edema and renal complications. The objective is to maintain a minimum urine output of 100 ml per four hours. We will commence Hartman's at a maximum of 80 ml per hour. And with consent, I would catheterize the woman and apply a urometer so we can maintain a strict fluid balance measurement to monitor her renal function. This will also enable a clean catch urine sample for urinalysis for proteinuria. Throughout the emergency, it's of course very important to monitor the fetus. Um, this is because of a potential maternal hypoxia from the seizure and also reduced maternal blood pressure causing a corresponding fetal bradycardia and reduced placental perfusion. Following the uh, clamptic fit, we must transfer the woman to labour ward or to HDU for close monitoring and to ensure that the blood pressure does not rise again, remains stable and to monitor any adverse effects for both the woman and the fetus. As the administration of magnesium sulphate is ongoing, we must monitor for magnesium sulphate toxicity. This means texting re testing reflexes and monitoring respiratory rate hourly. If top-up doses are given, then blood levels of magnesium sulfate may need to be taken. Delivery should be considered by the obstetric team and may need to be expedited. Antenatal corticosteroids therefore might need to be considered and we may wish to give the woman a prophylactic antacid. I would also ensure that I reassured any family members present um, um, and offer the client and birthing partner a debrief when appropriate. I'd ensure that all documentation of the incident was completed to allow for a case review if needed, including completion of an incident form. Discussion and debriefing with the clinical team involved would also be useful to ensure staff feel supported and are able to learn from previous incidents. This was an example of how to manage an eclamptic fit as part of your obstetric emergency Oscar Oski Viva Voce scenario. It's important to note that this is not an exhaustive list of the management. Most of the information here is taken from the prompt guidelines. However, it is important in clinical practice, you consult with your senior midwives, obstetricians, and you look at your local unit guidelines and policies. Thank you for watching.